Hello everybody, you have tuned in to Eric Jose on Making a Murderer on YouTube. I cover virtually any aspect of Making a Murderer. I go over the evidence, the documents, the photos. So if you'd like, stay tuned and in the future I'll have many more videos besides the one you're about to see. How are you doing everybody? We're back today again talking about the new Queso investigation there in Calumet County. Re uh, basically reopening the Teresa Halbach investigation into her death and now we've mo we've gotten to the point where they are interviewing Scott Taddock and Barb Taddock, Barbara Taddock. So, you know, obviously there's a lot of interesting things in here, I'll say, for sure. Um, but one thing I want to say before I even start, I personally disagree with Scott Taddock big time. Scott Taddock is 100% convinced that Stephen Avery is guilty and will quite honestly not shut up about how much control that he felt Stephen had over the whole entire family. Um, the, the other thing about... <sighs> The other thing when I read all this with Scott Taddock is the fact that his conflicting stories, um, even Dietering brings it up to him at one point in this, you know, interview, he brings up to Scott that you basically told two different stories about what happened when you picked Barb up. So it's, it's kind of one of those, you know, so which way, so which is it moments, right? And to me at that moment, it's, it's, it suggests to me that Dietering does not only have just orders to try to reinforce the convictions of Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey, I think they have like a contingency plan where if the actual local public opinion really, really begins to sway in the direction that, you know, most of us who don't live in Wisconsin look at it and see it, you know, for what it is. They're, I think they're they're kind of maybe getting prepared for the actual local public opinion in case it sways. And they are actually... I, I get the impression when he asks that question to Scott, you know, about when you came to pick up Barb, which was it? Was it, you know, was she, was she in the house or was she over by the fire? Because he gave... That's basically what he did. He gave two different counts. That's back then when this was all supposedly fresh in his memory, so... Some bones I have to pick with Scott on what he says here, but mainly, yeah, okay, yeah, I disagree with him. I'm not, you know, I'm not too upset with him, really. I mean, I know there's people out there that believe Stephen Avery is guilty. Would love to hear his reasoning uh, uh, as to why he's so sure. Um, because I know when I look at this investigation and I look at this evidence, the one thing I'm not is sure of anything. I'm, yeah, so... So I marvel at his surety in this, and uh, so find that I find it a little odd. The other thing is, is um, he, you know, he's not real popular with the family. That's what I. Another thing I picked up when I was reading this, and and he, I mean, he's truly, truly not very popular with the family at all. The one thing I can be sure of in this investigation is that I'm not sure of anything, because it it didn't follow the right it didn't follow the proper leads it it left areas uninvestigated, avenues uninvestigated. We still don't know who this person was that was calling Teresa for sure. I mean, Tom Pierce thinks it was Ryan Hillegas, but maybe it was somebody else. We'll have to see how it all plays out, but I mean. There was Ryan lying about the damage to the RAV4, claiming that there was an insurance claim. I guarantee you, if there was an insurance claim that they could look and point at, they would not be asking my call block to go digging through his computers, his old computers. I guarantee it. <laughs> so, we're going to move into the first bit now. Uh, basically, the first uh, opening segment kind of with Scott, and we'll come on back. All right, so this is the start of the interview with Scott Taddock. I will say, you know, sometimes, you, you know, when you're researching so many things and you're digging in so much, 
you sometimes kind of forget some of the little details about things that you researched in the past. And I'm kind of feeling that way about Scott Taddock now. I know that he has the differing statements, but it's been so long since I read them that I need to go back and review them. So I may revisit this particular thing here. He says about what he did on the on on the 31st of October, uh, 2005. I may revisit this subject uh, in a later video when I go back and refamiliarize myself with his statements fully. Um, but what does occur to me is is that there's an account out there that he was actually at work that day and received a call and stuff. So you'll keep that in mind and you may understand why when I'm reading this uh, it makes me go huh so anyways we'll start it out here we go Scott was asked if he was in any way involved in the homicide of Teresa Halbach and he indicated no not at all Scott specifically was specifically asked if he killed anyone including Teresa Halbach and his answer was no Scott was asked to review as best he could the events of 10:31:05. Scott stated his mother had back surgery at Aurora Bay Care in Green Bay, Wisconsin on that date. Scott was unsure if the surgery was in the late or early morning. Scott stated that after visiting his mother, he came back He came back to his residence at 12764 S Street, STH 47 in Mishicot between uh, 2.30 p.m. and 3.30 p.m., but closer to 3.30 p.m. Scott stated he then changed into his hunting clothes and went hunting. Scott went on to indicate that he now thought his mother's surgery occurred early to mid-morning on 10:31:05. Uh, that's the same thing as before. You don't know if it was early or mid-morning. Anyway, Scott stated after hunting he changed out of his hunting clothes and went to pick up his girlfriend at the time, his now wife Barbara. Scott stated that he and Barbara then went back to the hospital in Green Bay to visit his mother for some more. Scott indicated that he did not recall whether his mother had surgery in the morning or afternoon on 10:31:05. Scott stated it took approximately 25 to 30 minutes to get from his residence to the hospital in Green Bay. Okay, so as I said, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to go back and look at the statements of Scott Taddock again and look at some of the research I did way over, well over a year ago probably closer to two years ago so I'm going to go back and look at that and really get re-familiarized with Scott's statements um, and a few other things that you're going to see mentioned up here um, the thing about Stephen talking about Scott and his mom that you know there's I know I've seen stuff about all these things but I don't want to talk too much about it right now at the moment because I want to kind of re-familiarize myself with them because as I said it's been a long time since I looked at them and I would hate to misrepresent things i would like to make sure that 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 i you know am representing it properly it's important to me so but what does occur to me is that i know there is an account that scott was at work that day and got a phone call and then had to leave but by that account you see him giving there he was never at work he was at the hospital with his mom he says he left there went home got ready to hunt and went out hunting and then went out over later and picked up Barb and 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 that sort of thing so so there's no there is no going to work there so that's why I need to go back and really take a look and see what's going on with you know that particular day and some of the just peripheral things here that are getting talked about so that I'm just to refamiliarize myself so but I do know that there was that report of him getting a call at work and his account right there does not seem to account for him going to work at all so that's interesting to me now we're gonna move into basically the the trouble that that Scott has with the well the Avery family you know mom and pa Avery uh, Chuck and Earl um, and and the Dassey boys uh, the, I mean they all seem to harbor a bit of resentment towards Scott and I think as you see what's in these documents, it might become clear to you uh, as to why that might be. What's important is, is that because of the way that Barb and Scott got together, the kind of 
as they describe in the documents the hidden nature of their relationship, mainly because Tom Yanda was still living at the trailer up until, as you'll see in the documents here today, the 15th of October. So that's mid-month. You, you see Scott saying, you'll see Scott saying he thought Tom Yanda was still living there on the 31st. So you get this mixing of, you know, things that don't quite line up or match up. But, you know, it's also been 13 years. Uh, so it's, I don't expect everything to look perfect and line up perfect. Obviously, there's going to be some muddiness with, with memories over, over 13 to 15 years. Um, so... But the thing we're going to move into now is the trouble he kind of has with with the Dassey boys, like Brian and Blaine and that sort of thing, um, and and how they kind of have a little bit of resentment toward him. And it, it's it just, as I saw this whole thing of this whole reoccurring thing where these, you know, so many people were have had this resentment towards Scott. And... And then we we know that Scott is gung ho, you know, for you know the fact that Stephen Avery's guilty. Well, is it any wonder why the Averys and possibly the Dassey boys, who know that their brother is in prison because of what happened to Stephen, resented that attitude? I mean, I'm not saying it's right, but I'm saying, isn't it? I mean, can't we just realize that human nature, that that's, that's just something that could be, that should be, ex- well, that's to be expected, I should say. So, I, I think, I, I think it was a bit of a, I don't know, it was just a bit of a, 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 a very topsy-turvy time when this whole thing went down to begin with. And, uh, but I can honestly say that, I mean... It's not a mystery that the Averys and therefore the Dassey boys might have some resentments towards Scott. Looking at that, of course Stephen Avery was. I mean, look across the country. In most families, the eldest son is always favored. It's almost. I mean, it's that's ninety-five percent of the time, the eldest son is favored. That's not shocking. That's not. You know. I mean, it's, that's not out of the ordinary in any way. So. I don't understand why complaining about Stephen having control matters, but you know, maybe one of these days I'll have a I'll have a chat with Scott, you know, and I'll be able to ask him about some of these things. Uh, who knows? The the, the there, there's just too much inconsistency in Scott's statements for me to really be able to to know what of what he says might be truth and what you know because it, it like I said that's what happens when you lack consistency. Um, it just makes it makes it makes it impossible for people to be able to discern what they can believe and what they can't. So we're going to move into that now, where we see that Scott kind of has a little trouble with the with the Dassey boys, um, in terms of you know what seem like resentments. Scott indicated that just prior to 10.30.105, he was not at Barb- Barbara's residence a lot and thought it was because Barbara's then-husband, Tom Yonda, was still living at the mobile home Barbara owned on the Avery property. Scott stated his relationship with Barbara was kind of hidden. S- Scott, and Bar- Scott stated Barbara would come to his house more often than he would go to hers. Scott stated he barely knew Barbara's children at the time. Now, later on in this affidavit, we're going to find out that Tom Yonda was out. He was out on the fifteenth of October. And the fact that the the fact that the relationship is being referred to as hidden tells me that the relationship was going on before the fifteenth. And that's why it gets referred to as hidden, I think. So that's what that's just the way that those words strike me as I read them. Um Scott was asked if he knew or ever met Teresa Hallbach, and he denied ever knowing or having met her. Now, I would say one thing here about that, and I'll put up I'll put up uh, Jerry Buting's tweet here for y'all to say uh, see real quick. So this is a tweet from Jerry Buting recently, <clears throat> basically saying he had a f- fingerprint analyst testify that there were three known people's prints the cops never asked him to compare. Uh, with the eight unidentified latents found on the RAV4. Guess who? Colburn, Link, and Scott Taddock. 
Now that's interesting. You have a, the fingerprint analyst telling you this. Um, you know, I, I just find that interesting. But as I said, this is another thing that Scott Taddock may need to be worried about because he's he's part of this three, right? So I would say that if Jerry Buting, I don't know why Jerry Buting's hunch is that that that, that that's going to be Scott Taddock's prints on the hood there where you would essentially you know touch the hood in, in order to open it um, but he, he seems to think that there's a fair chance that it's Scott Taddock's prints there uh, Scott was asked how he got along with Brian Dassey Scott stated he got along good with Brian at first but that the relationship began to sour when Brian began speaking about this matter with attorney Zellner's investigators he only began speaking with Attorney Zellner's investigators in very recent years, recent time. That's not something that happened in the first 10 years you guys would have known each other or so. So that's 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 another odd statement. So it's, it's clearly telling me that Scott doesn't like, well, Scott has issues with Brian because Brian spoke to Kathleen Zellner, which... I would honestly hope for more substance for a reason why he would dislike or have issues with one of Barb's children. But that's none of my business. Scott believed that Brian was not telling the truth with respect to what he advised Zellner's investigators. Scott described Brian as being an edgy person. Scott stated that Brian once threw Scott off Brian's property when Scott made comments about some electrical work Brian was doing. Scott states he gets along okay with Bobby Dassey. Scott stated none of the children live with them any longer. Scott indicated Blaine now lives in Two Rivers, and Scott gets along well. Gets along when we're all together. Scott stated Brian has now <laughs> that Brian now has Blaine on Brian's side regarding the events of 10:3105. Scott stated that Barbara talks to Bobby, but she does not speak with either Blaine or Brian. Scott stated Blaine and Brian do not talk to Barbara at all. Scott stated that this is difficult because they all work at the Woodland Face Veneer. Scott stated Barbara works days and Blaine and Brian work the second shift. Scott was asked if he heard anything about other people being involved. Scott stated this is not something he talks about with Barbara or her family. Scott was asked how often they, they see Brendan. Scott stated they visit Brendan weekly, sometimes two times per week. Scott stated he does not believe Brendan is involved at all in the Teresa Hallbach matter, but stated Stephen, that's a different story. You know, is it a different story? I, I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear Scott Taddock's unique perspective on why Stephen Avery is guilty. I, I think I'd really like to hear that. Um, you know, just to just to be better more at grips with the situation here at least um, because I don't know what what evidence Scott sees um, other than this kind of very strange bit that we're about to see here Scott went on to indicate that Stephen controlled and ruined the Avery family life in the two years that Stephen was out of prison Scott stated he does not believe Stephen's brothers are involved Scott was asked if Barbara was Inside or outside of her trailer by the fire when he picked her up after hunting on 10:31:17, I had pointed out to Scott that he had given both of these versions in statements. So there you right there, right there we have the confirmation from Dietering that Scott's statements were inconsistent in the past, which is another reason that that drags Scott's credibility into question. Just you know, that's just the honest truth of it. Um, Scott's statements very much lack consistency and make them hard to put any stock in. Um, Scott stated he did not recall whether Barbara was in the house or by the fire when he picked her up after hunting. Scott recalled that when he and Barbara came back from visiting his mother, the fire was very big. Scott stated he, uh, he observed Stephen by the fire and another person who he believed must have been Brennan, Scott stated. But wait, Scott, I just thought you said that tr that Brennan wasn't involved with this Teresa Halbach thing. Which is it? <clears throat> yeah. He didn't know the boys all that well at the time, uh, and he, as he and Barbara had just begun seeing each other. 
But it had been a couple weeks at least because Tom Yonda had moved out on the 15th. It was the 31st. They were regarding their relationship still as a hidden relationship, which would only have been hidden because they were hiding it from Tom Yonda when he still lived there, to my mind. I mean, logically speaking. Um, so, it, it's, I mean, it stands to reason that Scott has been seeing, at this point on, 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 on October 31st of 2005, I would have to guess that Scott and Barb have been seeing each other for at least a month. Maybe a little more. Uh, you know, it's hard to say. But but judging by the fact that they refer to it as hidden tells me the, the, the one person they would have been hiding it from would have been the person that moved out 15 days previously. So. All right. So that's going to mostly wrap it up for the section with Scott. He does chime in a bit while they're talking to Barb. So we'll, we'll see a couple more things from him. But mostly it's going to be Barb now. Um, talking about a few things. Uh, one of those things will be Carmen Boutwell, which, if any of you don't know what that, what who that is, and why she's important or could be important, uh, I'll kind of try to try to give you a little explanation on that. Um, so now we'll move into the segment where they really focus on talking to Barb. Barbara was asked if she knew she had dial-up through America Online during October of 2005. Barbara stated she did not remember if she had AOL dial-up or not. Barbara was asked where the computer they had at the time was kept and she indicated it was a tower type computer. She thought it was kept in one of the boys rooms which which apparently a evidence video would show uh, when that vid evidence video comes out apparently. Barbara believed that it may be, have been in Bobby and Brendan's room. But she was not positive. Barbara stated the computer was also left in the living room at one time. Barbara was unsure as to whether the computer had a password. Barbara stated everything, everyone used the computer and her, and her ex-husband Tom Yanda was on it all the time. Barbara made the statement that she never used to lock her house and that anyone could go in there. Barbara was asked if she still had the computer that we were speaking about from 2005 and she indicated she did. Barbara was asked if we could access it and she indicated take it. Alright. The first thing I want to say is that it's really hard to like mistake that you whether or not you had America Online for your internet because I mean America Online the dial up process and all that the and the way it would say welcome and and the the way that you would hear the actual phones linking up and talking like and screeching at each other and everything i mean it's like a pretty unique experience that would stand out in your mind if you had it so that's something that kind of seems a little bit strange to me um but clearly there had to be an internet connection for the things to be appearing on the computer that did so but if, so I find that odd. But the other thing here is is that when they're asking for the computer here, I think the reason maybe why that they're asking for this computer is because they want to look and see what Barb was doing, judging by their next like couple of questions here. That they want to check it and see what was going on was with this whole reformatting and all this. So I guess they're trying to look and see if somebody was actually trying to erase a bunch of things on it or whether or not somebody was actually just trying to clean it up and make it run faster, right? So that could be why they were taking it. Um, I can't imagine why they would need to take it again for any reason other than to check that. But anyway, Barbara stated that it was unknown whether Stephen would come into her residence while she was at work, but she stated Stephen would just walk into her residence a couple times per week. Barbara again stated Stephen would just walk in. Barbara also believed that Jody Stokowski was in her house from time to time as Barbara would notice liquor missing. Barbara was asked about Brad Dassey's affidavit regarding her asking to have the computer reformatted. Barbara stated that, she, that this did not take place. Barbara stated she wanted someone to clean her computer because it was running slow. Barbara stated she believed this conversation took place way before this prior to 10.31.05. Barbara, Barbara remembered Brad asking her about a password, and he thought he could do it at home. Barb stated once again she never asked Brad to reformat anything and just wanted to make the computer faster. 
Okay, so there you have Barb saying that the reason for trying to reformat the computer and do that sort of thing with it was to make to get it to start to run faster, which was a common problem um, back in 2005 with computers because they were getting outdated so quickly. Um, it was hard to maintain the high level of speed that you would get out of them at first uh, over time. And so there were a lot of people that did a lot. They would you know, try a lot of things and do a lot of things to really make their PC the most efficient so that they could, you know, not have to buy a new computer every year or two and try to stretch them out and make them last a little longer. So there is, I mean, that that's a distinct possibility. It's that, that That's something that makes a lot of sense for that time period. Um, so it's, but like I said, all of this is going to get gone through every bit of this. The, the attorneys are going are to leave no stone unturned at this point. If the evidentiary hearing is granted and everything starts getting looked into, I mean, all of this is going to come under very close scrutiny and, and, and pretty much everybody's going to know what's what by the, by the end. So we'll have to see how it goes. But I, like I said, that sounds highly plausible to me. Um, but it also... It's also highly plausible that if there was something to hide, that they would want to hide it. So, I mean, each 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 one is equally plausible, each option. So, I mean, we're going to, obviously, there's going to be, I mean, obviously, the state took a look at it, and they're going to have some forensic report of what they found, of whatever they were, whoever tried to reformat it and what they were doing back in 2005, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So, I mean, no matter what, we're going to know what's what by the, by the time it's done. So we're moving to the next one now. Barbara stated that Tom Yonda moved out of the residence on 10-15-05. That's, that's 16 days before Halloween. Um, just, just pointing it out. And went to, to a residence somewhere in Manitowoc. Barbara stated Tom knew the doors to her residence would be unlocked. And Barbara stated that Tom was not welcome on the property by Barbara. But Tom used to visit Barbara's parents after she and Tom separated. Barbara also stated that Tom would go up north with her parents. Barbara indicated her parents did not like, and still do not, like Scott Taddock. Well, you know, after reading this report, and and reading that bit where Scott was talking about one or two of the boys having a problem with him because, you know, they felt like their mom shouldn't have been going out with him because she was still married sort of thing. So I can imagine how... Other people there at the uh, at the salvage yard could take a negative, a negative attitude to Scott Taddock. They could see him as what maybe sort of the home wrecker, right? And then suddenly, he's he's all involved with with putting Stephen, you know, back into prison. He's 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 completely on board with with all this BS that the state is saying. Um, and he, he clearly makes it very clear that he thinks Stephen is guilty. As I said, I'd love to hear his reasoning and love to hear his, you know, love to, to hear the, the logic of, to why he believes that. But the fact is he does believe that. And so it makes, it really doesn't surprise me that to this day that they do not like Scott Taddock because why would they? I mean, and I'm not saying anything about Scott. I'm just saying, why in, why on earth would the Averys have anything positive to say about Scott? Considering the way he was introduced to the situation and the fact that he, to this day, is completely on board with the railroading of their, of their eldest son. So, I mean, that, that's not altogether shocking to me. Alright, I'm going over this little bit because of this particular word right here. I'm going to read this to you and then we're going to go over why this is a typo. Barbara was asked what was going on in the family that would suddenly make Stephen start accusing everyone of doing things. Is accusing everyone? Well, anyway. Barbara stated she did not know. Barbara stated she only knew that Stephen wants out. Well, most people do. But uh, most people don't have the complete shoddy investigation uh that, that happened with Stephen and uh, but anyway Barbara was asked if Stephen was involved in Teresa Halbach's death and she stated she did think so but had no idea who might be involved okay number one 
to say she did think so is not correct. You would, you would, the way that you would say it, or the way that that would normally come out of people's mouth is you would say, she stated she thought so. Right? You wouldn't say she stated she did think so. No, the reason why did's there is because it was supposed to be a contraction of didn't. So it was, she stated she didn't think so. Right? Because you can't say I didn't thought so. That doesn't, that's not proper grammar. So you have to say, I didn't think so. So that's a, there's a typo there. There's an N apostrophe T on the end of didn't there that's missing. So if Dietering isn't an honest cop and doesn't end up fessing up that, that that's actually a typo at some point, we may need to get a little bit loud about this and bring out and, and point out the fact that the way that the turn of the phrase is, is you would, if you were saying it this way, you would, you would be saying she didn't think so. If you were saying she did think so, you would most likely say she thought so. All right, so now it's going to go into talking about Carmen Beltwell. <clears throat> Carmen Beltwell, like I, you're going to hear me talk a little bit about her. She's, she was a young lady who was pretty much the same age as Teresa, uh, related to Teresa, looked very, very much like Teresa. They had very similar facial structure and bone structure and body size and I mean just very very similar and there's I you know th the thing is is that during the week that the investigation was happening for Teresa Hallbox suddenly Carmen Boutwell on like the third and third or fourth suddenly turned up dead of an overdose and the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department were collecting her body paying for the cremation and but made the family wait a month for the ashes for the cremains and, and the, you know all that stuff right so that's always seemed a little odd to people and has created you know a buzz uh essentially because of how seemingly odd it is so what we're going to see here in the upcoming document is that you know barb was trying to help zellner get the phone number uh to be able to reach carmen's parents so that Zellner could test those cremains against some of the ash and stuff from the original investigation and stuff like that. So that's what the reason why they're talking about this is because Carmen Beltwell, the the absolute the timing of when she went missing, this kind of strange circumstances uh, of it that she she OD'd on methadone, which she wasn't known to use um, when she suddenly OD'd on it in the middle of this week of the Hallbach investigation, Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department paying for the cremation. Um, yeah, and then the parents having to wait a month to get their daughter's cremains. So, it was, there's a plenty of things there that were kind of just, like, odd. And so that's why Karma Batwell gets talked about, and that's, I just want to give you that little preface before you read this next bit. Okay, so now is where we get to the bit that mentions Karma Batwell. And for those of you out there who don't know about Karma Batwell, she was a girl that was fairly closely related to Teresa. When you look at pictures of them, they look very uncannily similar. Um, very, very similar facial features, body structures. I mean, they're just very, very similar. Um, and it just so happened that Carmen Boutwell, the week of 1031 through 11.5.05, that it was during that week that Carmen Boutwell was found dead of an overdose. And this overdose was on methadone, which is a drug that you generally can only get from clinics because they use it to, to try to wean people off of harder drugs like heroin and things like that, Oxycontin and all that. So it's that's why that's why they're talking about Karma Boutwell here. That's why Barbara is talking about giving Zellner the number for Karma Boutwell's parents, essentially. And, and that. So we'll go ahead and, and, and take a look at this and we'll talk a little bit more after. I asked Barbara about the evidence that she wanted to provide to Attorney Zellner. Barbara stated she wanted to talk to Attorney Zellner about Kevin Ramlow. Barbara also indicated that they were asked to provide Attorney Zellner with a phone number for one of the parents of a young lady named Carmen B Burtwell, but it's, it's, it's spelled really wrong. Her name's Carmen Boutwell, who died from an overdose. And Barbara uh, stated Carmen was cremated and Carmen's parents had to wait approximately one month to get Carmen's remains. Which would have been right about the time that they were finally filling out Teresa's death certificate. 
month after. Yeah, that's an uh, interesting coincidence. Scott stated he was asked if he would be willing to provide the, the parent's phone number to Attorney Zellner. Scott also indicated that the family was willing to give Carmen's cremains to Attorney Zellner to test against what ashes had been recovered. Scott indicated the information regarding the ashes was third-hand information. Barbara indicated that she had given the phone number for Carmen's parents to her brother Chuck, but Chuck did not pass along the information to Attorney Zellner. Barbara stated it was never her intention to kick Ms. Zellner off the property, but when Attorney Zellner's team found out Barbara and Scott were on their way over, Attorney Zellner's teams drove off of the property. Barbara and, Barbara and Scott estimated that there were between five and eight cars that they met leaving the property when they arrived. Scott went on to indicate that Stephen has, has his family controlled really bad. Barbara was asked why she thinks Attorney Zellner is pointing the finger at Bobby and Scott. And she indicated she did not know why. Barbara indicated that she never actually provided any evidence to Attorney Zellner concerning this matter. Barbara was asked if in the la if was asked if she learned anything in the past 12 years that might make her think that Stephen would have had involvement. Barbara indicated she did not hear anything, but Scott mentioned a conversation that Stephen had with Bobby Dassey and Bobby's friend Michael Osmondson about helping to hide or move a body. Now, this once again kind of comes back to a very interesting point. Mr. Michael Osmondson, at the time that this was all going down, he had a bit of a crush on Marie Avery. Marie Avery had something going on with Stephen. There's reports that Stephen was going to buy her some property, um, various things. And I mean, it's highly possible to me that this Michael Osmondson could have motive. Like he didn't like somebody messing with his girl or who, well, whether she was his girl or not, that, that he perceived her that way. Possibly. I'm saying this is just a theory. But the thing that the reason why I still consider it a theory is because it is Michael Osmondson that's bringing up this ghoulish conversation with Stephen in the first place, and uh, so I've always found that to be a little bit odd, and, and and so I find that strange that right now they're bringing up that conversation with Michael Osmondson, and uh, especially because. Kratz tried to bring all that testimony in through Bobby, but Bobby wasn't actually there talking to Stephen and, and, and Michael. Stephen and Michael were talking about, you know, where Michael was joking with Stephen about hiding a body, but Bobby was over on the other side of the room. I believe he was still carving, uh, skinning the deer and, and, and hanging the deer, and he wasn't actually right there listening. He wasn't actually like a, you know, part of the conversation. So we got... That's the other thing that always bothers me whenever I see Michael Osmondson's name is because they didn't try to bring in the testimony of this conversation he had with Stephen through Michael. They tried to bring it in through Bobby, who was across the room. But so I don't know. Always found that odd, but had to bring it up since I was reading that. But the big thing here is is that it looks like Zellner is at some point going to be able to get her hands on the remains of Carmen Boutwell, and she will be able to tell if the ash and the bones in the pit are a match to the, the, the remains of Carmen Boutwell that were given back to her parents. Um, it is a bit odd that, that, they, that they had to wait a month and that about a month is about the time that they were finally finalizing Teresa's death certificate. I, I, I find that coincidence to be a little bit, you know, I think worthy of, of further inspection. Okay, so just to kind of show people how similar, what you're looking at here is a picture of Carmen Boutwell and Teresa Halbach. That's Teresa on the right. That's Carmen Boutwell on the left. They're just very similar to each other. I mean, they look a lot alike in a lot of ways. I mean, they're they're closely related. So this is this is why this is a point of interest, and. Like I said, with the fishiness of what happened with Carmen Boutwell with her overdose with the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department, uh, 
taking over and paying for the cremation and everything just a lot of things about it that are just a little bit strange and odd and that's why this is a point of interest so just thought I'd show everybody that because it is kind of interesting all right so you know that's gonna pretty much wrap it up to today you know here for today um, you know I wanted to go over you know kind of how some of the inconsistencies of Scott Taddeck's statements you know are a little bit of a problem for me um, as I said I'm going to go ahead and try to look into more about the day of the 31st for him and some of the other you know accounts um, around Scott in particular you know like was mentioned in the phone call with Steven about Scott's mom and all those things I'm gonna go ahead and review those things again just to make sure you know to refresh my memory completely um, and and I will try to go ahead and address that particular day and the conflicting accounts of Scott um, just to to further to further illustrate why you know it, it's hard for me to to go along or it's hard for me to believe that Scott is so convinced of Stevens guilt when in my mind it's just really hard to be convinced of that the way that this investigation went so beyond that we also had you know the talk about Barb and, and what happened with that computer, the formatting, the deleting, or whatever it was. But, you know, obviously Barb is giving a, a highly plausible, you know, account that it was just, they wanted to just get the thing to speed up, which was common at the time, like I said. So there's, you know, some interesting things here. And like I said, the attorneys are going to go ahead and they're going to get at all of this. When the time comes, when everything's in court and all that stuff, you know, they're going to they're gonna find out what's what here. And they're going to sort out the, the BS and they're going to get to the heart of what's 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 what here. So, and then obviously finishing up there with Carmen Boutwell. I know there may be quite a few, quite a few people who are watching this video that have absolutely no idea who that is and never heard that name before. Well, she's, you know, as I explained here today, she's a girl that just had a very, very untimely demise right during the investigation of Teresa Hallbach's disappearance and, and murder and um, and the, and just some of the really strange circumstances surrounding her death and, and, and like I said the month that her family had to wait to get her cremains returned to them um, so that they could have proper services and whatever it might be so uh, so there's some interesting things here obviously and there's you know so we'll talk a bit about more a bit more about the queso report and I'm sure this in the in some coming videos um, I'm sure there will be more things filed in the future they're gonna refer to things that are refer referenced here or things that are referenced here so I mean all these things are important because it all builds um, and and it allows us to look and see what, what what's what you know are things believable are they plausible is you know and we can so that we can better navigate and see you know where there's where there's meat on the bone and where there's really not meat on the bone so anyways so that's about it for today folks i hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you in the future if you haven't already please hit subscribe